trying to read and write formulas can sometimes feel like <laughs> in this episode I'll be covering some of the tools you can use to help keep your sanity when it comes to formulas and with that being said let's get hacking What's up, everybody? Thank you for sticking around. As always, I'm James with Microvellum, and this is Wood Hacks. We're continuing on with our spreadsheets mini series, and in this episode, we're gonna go over the formula editor and the function arguments tools. By far, these are the best tools you have at your disposal when it comes to working in the spreadsheets. I'll cover how you can use these tools to help write formulas and how to read and reverse engineer them. So let's get started. All right, so in this example, we're gonna add some logic to the adjustable shelf quantity of this upper cabinet. This product, being as short as it is, doesn't need two adjustable shelves. So let's go ahead and jump right into edit design data for this guy. The formula we're gonna be changing is in the adjustable shelf quantity prompt. Clicking on the drop down list here, I'm just going to scroll down and select adjustable shelf quantity. First thing we're going to learn is how to figure out what the existing formula is doing. We're going to open the formula editor using F2. You can also open it by double clicking. Most of the time this works, sometimes it doesn't. Or if you have a programmable mouse with an empty button, assign F2 to it as I've done with my mouse. Very helpful, by the way. Just for a quick run through of what we see here, we've got our formula window, a checkbox to increase the size of the text, the find and replace button, the paste name button, and the function button. Looking at this formula, until you get familiar with certain functions, it's probably gonna look like it's written in a foreign language. Well, lucky for us, we have a translator and we're gonna be using this translator to break down this formula in another segment of functions. So by highlighting the function, in most cases, the function will be in all caps, and then selecting the function button, the function arguments window will open. Before we jump into breaking down the formula, let's take a quick minute to go over what we have available to us in this window. At the top, we have the function list. This contains a list of the functions broken down by category to help you write formulas. We'll be using this a little later in this episode. Below the list, when a function has been selected, we can see a simple description of the structure of the function. And then below that, we can see the fields for inserting the arguments to work with the function. In this case, we have a text argument and a logical test argument. Next to the fields, we have the name button and function button. Beside the function button is a view of what the field is calculating or the value it's returning. If you happen to have an error being calculated or returned, you'd be able to see that here. At the bottom is a help window that will describe how each argument is used. Okay, on to breaking down and reverse engineering this function. We can see in this case, the function is only using the text argument. The logical test for this function is optional and is used in conjunction with the text to determine if this is an A1 style reference or a row and column style reference. What? An A1 style reference is the most used reference style. It simply looks for an exact reference or name of a cell. A1 would be a specific cell. A defined name would also be a specific cell. A row and column reference would be typed out as R for row and the row number and C for column and the column number. So the text in the case of a row and column style reference would be something along the lines of R95C2, which in conjunction with a false value in the logical test 
would look to the value in row 95, column two. To be honest, I don't believe any formulas within Microvellum use the row column styles, so you probably don't need to put much thought into this. Going back to our formula here, we also have another function being used, my category. Highlighting this function and clicking the function button will break it down for us again. In this case, it's looking to the product code define name and returning the code value for this product, which is then returning the category for this code, which is upper. Congratulations, you just reverse engineered a formula. Going back to the formula editor window, let's start adding some logic into this formula. I'm gonna highlight everything behind the initial equal sign and just cut it. Next, I'm gonna click on the function button. And without a function highlighted, you will get the following message saying the formula could not be evaluated. Well, duh, we haven't typed a formula yet. So just ignore it and click OK. Back in the function arguments window, we're gonna add an if statement. We'll actually be adding a few, but let's start with the first one. By clicking on the function list and then going to the logical category, we're gonna select the if function. With an if function or if statement, you're always going to have three arguments. A logical test, is this value true or false? A value if the test is true and a value if the test is false. For our formula, our value if false is gonna be the previous formula we cut. So I'm just gonna paste it here. We're gonna build this formula to determine the quantity of shelves based on the inside height of the product. If you don't know what the defined name is for this reference, you can use the name button to find it. So here we can see the different categories of defined names that we can paste into our formula. In this case, we want to reference a local variable. Then from this list, we want to find and select the variable for the inside height and then click OK to insert. You'll notice it added an L exclamation point prefix. This designation is used to determine which workbook we're referencing. We'll go over workbook references in the next episode. But in this case here, we're already looking to the L level or local level, so we can just erase the prefix. At the end of this, we want to add a little more to this formula. If the inside height is less than a value, let's say 24 inches, then we want to return a different shelf quantity. So in this case, the logical test is true, so we could enter a value of one in the value of true, but we wanna make this a little bit smarter and more automatic. So let's go ahead and add another if function. For our logical test, let's look to see if the inside height is less than 12 inches. It is not, but if it was less than 12 inches, we'd want the shelf quantity to be zero. So that will be the value if true. Now, because this if statement is a nested if statement, meaning it's an if statement within an if statement, I'm getting all sorts of inception flashbacks now, the value if false will be the value we want from the parent if statement, which was if the inside height is less than 24 inches. So in the event that it is less than 24 inches, but not less than 12 inches, we want one shelf. Let's go ahead and insert this function. Looking at our main function or formula, our if statement would read and calculate as follows. If the inside height is less than 24 inches, then if the inside height is less than 12, use zero shelves. Otherwise, if the inside height is not less than 12, but still less than 24 inches, use one shelf. Otherwise, return the default value of shelves based on the product, which would be two for my upper cabinets. Insert this function and click apply formula and We've got a smarter formula that will take away a manual process of changing the shelf quantity if the inside height of the cabinet is less than 24 or 12 inches. And that will conclude this segment of Functions. With a save, close, and redraw, we can see our product only has one shelf. Now, 
Would I type that formula just to change the quantity from two to one every time? <laughs> Absolutely not. The next step for me would be to make this change at a library level. In all actuality, I would make the formula change to the project wizard at the library level. Perhaps after this mini series, I'll do a quick episode on how to do just that. But at least for learning sakes, you now know how you can use the formula editor and function arguments tools. And that's gonna wrap up this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode of Wood Hacks where we'll discuss workbook relationships. Until then, stay sharp, stay focused, and above all, stay awesome. A row and column reference would be typed out as R row. <laughs> Whoa, hey, uh, you turd bucket. Without a function highlighted, you will get the following message. Message, 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 message. We'll go over workbook references in another <laughs> meaning it's an if statement within an um, in the event that it is less than 24 inches, but not less than 20. One more time. One more time.